There are two short videos that I would like to play for you first. Warm you up a little bit. everyone. As mentioned, my name is Sarah Nathanson and I'm one of the lawyers at DHX Media. I am not one of the people in the IT department, as you could tell there. So DHX Media, we are a public global company, but we, or at least I, like to think the heart of it is right here in Vancouver. Don't tell anyone in Toronto I said that. We just finished building a brand new studio where we've got approximately 750 animation artists and crew working on some amazing shows, which you didn't get to see because the little video didn't work. Uh, but there are Super Noobs, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, The Deep, Blaze, My Little Pony. So the point of my talk is to talk a little bit about how we get those shows from our studio out into the market and ultimately out into the family rooms of children around the world. Or reaching back even further, how do we get a show from an idea into actual physical production in our studio so that we can go and sell it? So no matter what size you are, there are two big components to such an endeavor. Relationships and structure. Relationships first. So as I know you all know, you got to know people, right? No matter what you've got to contribute to digital animation, you're going to need some other people. 
Whether you've got an idea, like a concept or a script, some characters, any kind of intellectual property or IP that you're wanting to produce, or perhaps you have a process, a new way of um, storing data or producing a certain look in a show, or maybe you're an animator and you're looking for work. All of these situations need somebody else. So whether you need an, an IP owner or a studio or a broadcaster. So to link up with the people that you need, obviously, you network. Get out there and meet people. Events like these are great, and there are dozens of other opportunities out there. DHX executives are constantly on the road traveling, attending markets and summits, trade junkets, animation summits, and festivals. The biggest event that comes to mind is Kids Screen. Kids Screen Summit um, for the past couple of years has been held in Miami, Florida in the middle of February, so it's not such a bad destination. It bills itself as the leading conference on the business of kids entertainment, hosting nearly 1,800 attendees from around the world. And according to their website, they are the leading conference on the business of kids entertainment, where top decision and deal makers attend to engage in critical dialogue, network, and find new ideas. So, Miami, Florida, Kids Screen Summit, February 2018, be there. So, now this is where you might be thinking, yeah, right, as if I have the cash to head to Miami for a couple of days to talk to some people. Well, this is where our friend Prem Gill enters the picture with Creative BC's Passport to Market. If you don't know, Passport to Market is a program which provides travel funding support for BC resident producers, film, TV, and new media to attend international markets and conferences. The fund is intended to help you get out there and network. Many, many events are passport to market eligible, meaning if you want to attend, you can apply to Creative BC for travel funding support. So yesterday I looked quickly at the website, the Creative BC website, and there are 30 eligible events listed within the span of 12 months. And the list is diverse. It ranges from the Electronic Entertainment Expo in Los Angeles to Sunnyside at the Dock for documentary film producers in Annecy, France. My point is this, Prem has cash, and you can apply for it. And once you attend these events, meet people, exchange business cards, come back home, as you know, it's important to keep up on those relationships. And that is where the, what our SVP of animation, Kirsten Newlands, here in Vancouver likes to call the thousand dollar cup of coffee. If your potential clients or partners are in Los Angeles, for example, it may be worth it to fly down, book a hotel room, and get in front of those people for a cup of coffee. DHX has bought cups of coffee for people for years before finally the stars align and we're able to actually embark on a project together. Which brings me to my second topic, structure. I'll be quick here as this is aimed specifically at those of you in the crowd wanting to produce. Making a television show or a feature film is expensive. Really expensive. So this is where two different options come in handy. The official treaty co-production and the co-venture. The official treaty co-production is where production companies in two or three different countries get together to make a show. They collaborate on everything from development, production, and financing, and then together at the end, you share the copyright together of the actual show that you make. A prime example of this is our show called The Deep, which is now in season two production, and we're making it with an Australian co-producer. But the tricky thing about the official treaty co-production is that American companies do not qualify. For that, you look at the co-venture. Partner up with a company in the US, and your show may qualify for the slightly lower tax credits, but the advantage you get is that the show will count as Canadian content for a Canadian broadcaster. That means the show is easier for you to sell and therefore easier for you to get on screen. So in summary, 
and I'm a little bit quick here because my video is missing, get out there, talk to people, figure out how you can structure your show or your project to take advantage of the programs and incentives that are available. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking around here. I think there's a nice segue between the previous panel and this one in that uh, it's uh, the collaboration theme is, is a big one. And, and uh, I'm here because of a collaboration of four universities, UBC, SFU, Emily Carr, and BCIT. And also the, uh, the Reboot, some of our, our students worked on that, that first gamed version of Reboot. And we've got some panelists here who, you know, that, that nascent VR industry, this is the big deal. Like this, these people run big studios that employ lots and lots of people. And they have um, maybe the, the other challenges of keeping things alive in, in sometimes difficult markets. And I think also the, the uh, collaborative nature when things are small starts to get a little maybe more difficult as things get big. And it's very, very competitive, not just amongst yourselves, but globally. So anyway, we're going to have a freewheeling uh, conversation, I think. And, um, but we've got these people make some of the most famous video content in the world. And so they have some show reels and, and, and then an introduction. So what I'd like to ask each person, do you have your? I, no, I didn't bring media with me. No reel, OK. But you don't get out of, of, of an introduction. Not a I want them to just tell you a bit about <laughs> not only who they are and what they do, but how they came to be in Vancouver, them personally, and why their studios here, so. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, hey folks, uh, I'm Cam. I am the Computer te uh, Graphics Technology Supervisor at Industrial Light and Magic in Vancouver. Uh, we partner with top filmmakers to deliver their stories without limits. Quite literally, our job is to create something the audience has never seen before. In its 40-year history, ILM has amassed an impressive list of film credits. Select highlights include, Forrest Gump, Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, and of course, Star Wars. Growing up in Canada, Hollywood was another galaxy far, far away. I love movies, but never considered that I could be a part of it. At university, I studied architecture. It was there I stumbled upon CAD software, and it turned out I had a knack for it. I never looked back. Finally, in 2002, my work was projected on movie screens across the world. That film was the now classic Undercover Brother. <laughs> I had written hold for applause. I don't know if there's been any, many big uh, Eddie, Eddie Griffin fans. Uh, we will talk to Eddie and Dave Chappelle about that. Um, not one to rest on my laurels, I set my sights on bigger things, blockbuster movies. At the time, that meant I'd have to move. Uh, these projects were not being done in Canada. That began a 10-year journey across the globe. Uh, first to the Bay Area, then to London, then to New Zealand, then London again, and finally, uh, Australia. Uh, I was fortunate to be a part of some of the biggest VFX houses in the industry, including Weta, Framestore, MPC, and Sony. But there was always one missing from the list. Finally, last year, I joined the company whose work inspired the entire journey, and ironically, I did so back in Canada, where it all began. Uh, pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Nice round the world trip there. Around the world. <clears throat> and across all the studios, maybe we can pick up on that movement thing later Absolutely. on. Yeah. So. Hey everybody, so I'm the, as was said, I'm the Senior Vice President of Production at Sony Pictures Imageworks. We are celebrating our 25th year in the business this year, which makes us very excited. We started off in Los Angeles, where we still are, Culver City, and it, we opened up our facility in Vancouver in 2010. We were 80 artists at that point. In 2014, we decided to go big here, and we moved our headquarters to, to Vancouver and uh, built a 72,000 square foot purpose-built facility with our own in-house training facility as well. Now, with a little bit of extra growth, we can house about 800 people in Vancouver and 200 people in Los Angeles. Um, you know, we, we are lucky enough that at Imageworks, we work in two main sectors of the digital media industry. We do live action visual effects for the Hollywood major studios, and we also work in feature length animation. We've worked by this point at about, on about 100 projects to date. We've got two Academy Awards, one for our uh, best animated short for Chub Chubs, and one for our visual effects in Spider-Man 2. Um, stuff that we have coming up gives you a sense of the diversity of our work. We've got 
Smurfs The Lost Village coming out next month. <laughs> um, following that, we have Spider-Man Homecoming in July. Following that, we've got the Emoji Movie in uh, September. And then we've got Kingsman The Golden Compass coming out in October, just to name a few. It shows our range between visual effects and animation. Um, not only do we get great, com great projects to work on at ImageWorks, we're also um, technology innovators. Our artists have been awarded with six SciTech awards by the Academy, three of which we just got this year, of which we're really proud. We're really very excited to be part of this community here in Vancouver, BC, where we're really at the forefront of technical innovation and content innovation, which I've been lucky enough to be a part of for my whole career. So two seconds about me. I started in the business in 1993, in when film was really starting to go, go blockbuster in this town. Um, great time to start, because there was lots of opportunity. I was in post-production. I ended up eventually running the Technicolor here, which at that time was a uh, traditional film laboratory, um, digital dailies. We had picture post-production to completion, including DI, and we had a really small little visual effects uh, company at that time. I made the move over fully to visual effects when in 2007, London-based moving picture company, MPC, decided to open up an office here. And I was there up until eight months ago when I moved to Imageworks and I'm having a great time. Um, so I feel like I've been very lucky to have my entire career in this great place and also able to work really in these really great, big brand, ambitious companies. And Thanks I do have yourself. a reel. You do have a reel. Let's see that, just a little bit of our work. I am in love. Are you in love? I'm in love too. I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <clears throat> I feel like I should be like a talk show host and then we should now talk about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, Sharon, maybe we can uh, get an intro yep. to you and your studio. Yep. Hi, I'm Sharon from Animal Logic. Um, I started with the animal family over 10 years ago, started in the finance department, then after many years in production, um, subsequently in the role I'm here now, um, executive VP and GM for the Vancouver studio. Um, I consider I've grown up in this industry um, within Animal Logic and really have a great passion for both. Uh, Animal Logic is one of the world's most creative digital studios, producing award-winning, groundbreaking animation, visual effects and design. We independently owned and in 2016 celebrated our 25th anniversary with around 800 crew across studios in Sydney, LA and Vancouver. We are committed to technical and creative excellence, innovation and storytelling. In our 25 years, we've had the opportunity to collaborate with some revolutionary directors and producers to create some spectacular and memorable images and stories. One of our first feature film collaborations was Babe and then moved on quickly to films like Face Off, The Matrix, Moulin Rouge, 300, and of course our dancing animated penguins in Happy Feet in 2006. The last 10 years have been prolific for our animation visual effects studio with credits including Great Gatsby, Iron Man 3, Hunger Games, Avengers, and two blockbuster hits, The Lego Movie and The Lego Batman Movie. Go see it. <laughs> <laughs> in late 2015, we opened here in Vancouver, and in our first five years, we'll partner with Warner Brothers to create three fully animated films, our first being the Lego Movie sequel, set for release in 2019. We are determined to be one of the most sought-after studios to work with in Canada, based on the quality of our projects, our work, and our amazing team of talented artists and crew. British Columbia has a thriving digital media industry and amazing local and international talent, which was a key reason for us opening and expanding here. I'm excited to be part of such a thriving industry and Animalogic is keen to work with other studios to make Vancouver one of the best, if not the best, digital media hub in the world. 
Uh, we've always had big dreams of animal, and our show reel hopefully shows some of that. <laughs> okay. Top of the charts again, it's Everything is Awesome. Oh my gosh, I love this song. Everything is awesome. Nice work. And last but not least, Jennifer. Hi, I'm uh, Jennifer McCarran. I'm currently president of Atomic Cartoons. Uh, like Sharon, I grew up in the industry. My first job was as an office PA on Reboot, <laughs> the first CG uh, show ever created, and uh, slowly whittled my way through there. I was lucky enough to be at Mainframe and Rainmaker for 14 years, and in uh, 2010, I joined Atomic, where they wanted to introduce CG. Um, it's, uh, Atomic's been around for over 20 years now. Um, the history is heavily steeped in 2D. Uh, we now do um, about 50% 2D, about 50% 3D, and uh, we also have a motion comic pipeline as well as a VR pipeline. So, um, you know, we offer a lot of services to clients. Um, we deliver shows uh, for Netflix, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Amazon, uh, we're also developing shows uh, with a lot of those players. And we were recently lucky enough to have our own IP launched with Netflix, an original series called Beat Bugs, which was 52 11-minute episodes, each 11-minute episode featuring a song from the Beatles. Um, and it was a very simple, lovely show about bugs in the backyard <laughs> singing along to the Beatles. Um, and uh, so I'm really happy to be here today on this uh, amazing panel. And, and thank you for inviting me to join. Did we have a reel. You have a reel? Oh, yeah. awesome. A little short one. I've been dying to see the bugs. Yeah. <laughs> So you know everyone calls us all angry birds, Yeah, right? because we're super angry. Well, I was, you know? was going to say, you're not very angry, and I'm, I'm really angry. Uh, excuse so, me? Yeah, so just being around you kind of like brings down my level of anger. 
and I'd like you to kind of amp it up a little bit more. Amp? I can't amp it up. I'm obviously the angriest bird. You're making me look bad here, man. Look how angry I am. You're, you're smiling. You're smiling when you Burr. do that. You, angry. You, get that. You can't stop smiling. Just, I've never seen you not I'm smile not, it's once. It's not a smile. It's an anger frown. That's it's an anger face. I think we could just do that all afternoon. Let's <laughs> play them again. Um, so as large organizations, either in and of yourselves or part of a global network, I think the, the really big challenge is talent. And we, we did a little setup conversation. And I think everybody has something to say about this challenge, opportunity, and it relates to why you're in Vancouver, but it also relates to some struggles in Vancouver. So I think maybe we just go down the list and, and give us some views you have on the, the talent benefits of being in Vancouver, but the challenges as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the, um, the key thing you have to focus on is just Vancouver as a magnet. Uh, what can you do to draw people here? Uh, you know, it's a great city for young people to be in. Um, but I think a longer term issue we have to look at is, is it also a great city for families to be in? Uh, you know, someone who comes over for a short term contract can live in a 400 square foot Yale Town apartment, but if they stay for 10 years, you know, perhaps they have a family and that grows, that doesn't necessarily scale for us. And I think where Vancouver's excelled has been a really great magnet for people to join the industry and to grow into the industry. But I do think we have to focus longer term on how we mature in the city. Uh, and I think that's a huge focus is, you know, uh, focusing on how families grow in the city, right. uh, schools, housing and all that. Is ILM doing anything on your own in that? Or is this kind of more of a general lobby wish we could do more kind of thing? Yeah, I think it, I think specifically for the industry is an issue facing us. Um, I don't know that we necessarily have programs directly directed at that, yeah. that issue. Yeah, I would say it's been said in this room before and also in the other rooms, talent is, talent is the biggest issue. Um, having been in the industry as long as I have, what we focused on to get ourselves to where we are today is in two prongs, and I think that will continue into the future. Growing local talent, for sure, and being able to attract international talent. We have needed both to build at the scale and, sp and, and pace that we have, um, but we also will continue to need it because this is a global industry and all these companies and many others want to be at the top of the game globally, and this is a global market, so we also need to be able to bring in, attract, and also get in international talent. I think hitting on those two aspects is really key, and, and to Cam's point about you know growing talent in the future, there's a lot of uh, talk and there's a lot of things underway mm -hmm. to try and make sure that we get a, a talent pipeline going. Uh, we can talk about it more later. Uh, uh, we're working with the provincial government on a labor market partnership program with technology writ large. Um, but that's really focusing on attraction, retention, and, and education for the industry, and that's, that is the future of it. There's lots of other technology industries coming up, VR, AR. We have all this talent. Some of that talent's going to go there. We need to keep the influx coming. In your opening remarks, you mentioned an in-house training program. Mm -hmm. How big is that, and is that a big part of your growth? It's a really growth? big part of our, of our organization. So everybody, all of us, when, when a new artist comes in, has a has a you get a week or two of training, for sure. You have to, we all have bespoke tools. In addition to that, we have an internship program. In addition to that, we have an ongoing program of um, upscaling artists. We all get downtime between projects. We don't, like big companies, at a thousand person company between projects, we do go up and down. But it does give us the opportunity in downtime to upscale and re-educate our crew. So we have a, we have a good sized team. We have right. about a, um, our facility probably, our training facility c can hold about 25 people at any given time and is ongoing. And it's also cross-training as it the is cross technology shifts. Exactly. We have to, you know, not only do we want to be at the top of our game, but all of our crew do. So, you know, they want to go somewhere where they feel that they're progressing in their craft um, and working on the best projects, working with the best directors, best filmmakers, the people pushing us forward. So we need to make sure that we're there to support that with their training and the, you know, the cross-growth, 
Everybody wants to be in VR as well. How do we support that without competing in all of those spaces? It's, you know, it is a challenge that we face, but it's exciting. And we've got to also let our teams direct us in the way that they want to learn and they want to grow. Uh, they're the ones that come up with all the amazing ideas and push us forward. So we've really got to embrace that as right. part of our culture. So it sounds like, in a way, being at the cutting edge requires that you do training. And it also is an attraction to people who they want to either come or stay because you're at the cutting edge. So they see themselves getting, so training is actually a double win for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a win for everybody involved. You know, the broader industry, you know, we would, everybody was mentioning before people move from gaming to film back to VR over to, you know, we're all sharing the same talent pool. So it helps when we've all, when they've all been sort of cross-trained in those areas. And I think, oh, no, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that, that, that cross-training and that, that movement of talent has been key to our growth. And I think um, we can talk about this more, but the collaborative nature of what we do, we do have people moving back and forth. Cam and I worked together when I was at NPC, then we worked together when we were at Exactly, yeah. Um, it's really key to keeping the level of talent and the level of product really, right. really high. Right. And uh, you know we face similar challenges at Atomic. We're more of a boutique studio. We're between 250 and 300 people. Um, you know when um, the big corporations landed, like Sony and Animal Logic, we felt some whoa, shudders. Uh, you know because a lot of our crew, that our senior crew, was like, oh my gosh, and ILM, I can go work at these amazing shops. Um, and so we um, and we do feel because we do a lot of investment in talent training them between 2D, 3D, VR. We try and do things that maybe we couldn't offer at a big company, like if you know, really focus on work-life balance. You know, you can have your kids at three. We don't. You can work from home. Like trying to do those things so that we have a little bit of a competitive edge. Um, but ultimately, it's great when the big players like ILM and Sony and Animal Logic do land because they bring in so much talent with them, and I think it's healthier for the industry overall. Um, where we are, uh, you know, kind of what Cam was saying, we do work a lot to bring up supervisors and really try and promote from within so people can see a very clear career path. You know, we have people that have been there 10 years that were animators that are now directing um, and try and create that path for them. Uh, where it does get hard in today's market is with the housing. Uh, you know, it's one thing as a 20 something year old to bunk in in an apartment. But then we have, you know, our guys that we've been investing in for 10 years and we really hope they feel part of the team and will stay and they're key to our success, but they have babies and they move to the island. And that's, you know, that's not every story, but it's not an uncommon one. So um, those are some of the challenges that we're facing and some of the benefits that we're facing from having such a vibrant market here. Have, have you um, taken the talent and the talent development to a more formal level in terms of either internal certificates or programs as such, and or going and allying with uh, Emily Carr or BFS or the other uh, institutions in town? A number of our programs are all very, uh, very proprietary. So we, uh, again, on that cutting edge theme, we have to write a lot of custom things because the one thing we can't do is say no to the director. <laughs> uh, over the years, we've tried, but without <laughs> success. And our value add is to, you know, they ask for something and we can deliver. It's always okay, let's try it, let's do that. And a lot of the times, a lot of the commodity so uh, solutions will follow up, but if you're on the cutting edge, you have to write it custom. And so for us, we don't have a certification per se, simply because we have to train people up on our tools. Um, and it's really, you learn on the job and you learn on the shows. So that makes it harder for you to say, find a, an alliance with a local school or whatever either, because they don't have those tools? Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point where I, there's always a lot of focus on software tools itself, and I think the one thing that I find that is most out of sync possibly with the schools is an education environment is very different. So it's an area of exploration, journey, creativity, and so on. The production environment, it's art with deadlines, and I think that is the roughest adjustment for folks who come into our studio. And one of the biggest challenges we have is, you know, schools will come to us and say, you know, hey, can we, we've got 25 people who can stay with you for two weeks. And we say, well, you know, um, we, they need to be effective and they need to be delivering because of those deadlines and that environment. Um, it would be great to figure out with schools, you know, how can we participate in those you know, mock environments, you know, like I think co-ops are great, those are mentioned, um, but really trying to align those two things. I think the tools, you know, a lot of the 3D tools and 
uh, visual effects tools are taught in the schools, um, the skill sets there, the talents there. Uh, I think the one missing ingredient that I see most often when folks come in is just they don't have that experience of what is the production cycle and what's the pace of it and what, what are the demands on the artists. Right. And you have yeah, other... Yeah. It, it, to Camp's point, I think, you know, we, we, these brands work at such a high level. We really are doing the best work in the world and that's always been our goal. So it was, it's been really challenging to figure out how to get young grads or how to connect to the schools. Some facilities are doing a, a really good job of it, um, be, just out of necessity, purely. Um, other, we do have this great hub here and we have fantastic schools, but our schools are one-year programs and CAP has a two-year program. We look at other areas of the world, UK, where there's Bournemouth, where those are four-year degree programs and we mm -hmm. don't have the benefit of that. So what some facilities have done, because we've, again, we've grown so fast, we, we do need junior talent, so some facilities are putting more robust training systems in place. The last company I was with, MPC, is a, has an academy where we bring recent grads in, we specialize, they specialize them and put them into shot training. But to Camp's point, it's, we, we teach them the bespoke tools and get them working on really high level shot work. And then they're just coming in at the very bottom. It, it takes a long time to get there, but I think we have to try. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's come on to companies to take that up because just the schools haven't really caught up with us yet. Again, great programs, just not at the level that we're working, I think. Yeah, Animalogic, we have just started, I think it's our first semester in Sydney, partnering with the university um, to create our academy in Sydney. Um, and I think the biggest gap we were seeing in the market is people will know the tools and they'll be great artists, but what's missing is that industry readiness, you know, how to be part of a bigger team, how to be part of a business, um, and that feedback process that you can go through. Some of our crew will get notes and, you know, do versions, up to 100 versions of a single shot. And we do see a lot of people that come in from school and they're like, it's not approved first time. And <laughs> <laughs> it's never approved first time. No. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, creating, you know, a program where people feel confident and they don't let those sorts of setbacks demoralize them and cut them down um, and having them be ready to work with, you know, what can be 400 people working on a film, you know, working as part of a team, which I think we'll get onto collaboration a bit later, but that's one of the biggest things about working in our industry. There's so many people and they're just, you know, a small piece of it, very creative and part of the filmmaking process, but it's working with others that is one of the biggest challenges. So teamwork and timing, big issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For us, um, we work really successfully with all the schools. We're in the high schools as well. I think because we're doing television, the quality bar isn't such that, I mean, our quota in animation is around 20 seconds per animator per week. I'm sure it's closer to five or six, mm -hmm. if that. And so we can get people going a lot more quickly. Um, and the schools are terrific. Um, we are going, we go to every grad show. Uh, we meet with students before they graduate. Um, you know, uh, VFS, Capilotto College, Emily Carr, the Art Institute, the list goes on. Um, they're fantastic. And the government has invested a lot with us to make that happen. So we have great success there. Where we run into trouble is they graduate from our school and go over here. And then, you know, so we don't have our, our supervisors and directors as much. That's the part that is, you know, increasingly as we do higher and higher end television, hard to secure. And it, it, any team's like a great sports team. I'm sure you guys will agree. You need your seniors, your middles, your juniors. And so it's just finding that perfect magic of that mix isn't, is very challenging. It's yeah. not always easy. So before we leave the talent, maybe we could just talk on that attraction of global talent and, mm -hmm. and what are the special things that you use to bring people here, aside from the mountains and the trees and so on. But. <laughs> I, one thing specific for us, it's, um, it all starts with the projects and the teams. And I, I, we, we really found a niche for ourselves to get the high-end projects, working with the high-end directors, and people just want to be a part of that. And building that brand over so many years, that's the key thing people talk about, you know, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. That's always, you know, new starters always talk about Star Wars. Um, but that, that gets people in the door, but I think you have to continue to build that and also tailor uh, your studio to the local feel. Um, so ILM has a studio in Vancouver. We have one in uh, San Francisco is the headquarters. We also have London and we also have Singapore. Each one of those are very different groups uh, with a different personality and different style of management. Uh, we collaborate on shows, we uh, share projects, and um, I think that has helped our reach globally to attract people because, you know, 
coming to ILM just does, it doesn't simply mean coming to San Francisco anymore. It can mean going to London. It can mean moving between the facilities. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, those choices are really great where um, oftentimes people might have moved to an area that was a hub but not their home, and now they can move somewhere closer to where they uh, originally came from. So I think that's a great benefit uh, for attracting talent. Right. Yeah, I would agree. It's, it's projects. Um, projects. When you're talking to high-level artists, you're still talking to the 14-year-old in them who wanted to work in movies. Yeah. So it's really the, the talent attraction. For us, one of the benefits that we have is, again, working in visual effects and animated movies that people can move from one to the other. So that creates a certain culture. Visual effects, live action visual effects are, are fast-paced. They're deadline-driven. Um, feature animation is the same, but it has a longer timeline. So that is something that we use anyway. It's, it, we find that people enjoy the ability to Having move Having some and balance forth. and some yeah. mixing it up. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's the, you know, the projects definitely help, you know, having um, the ability to provide people with longevity in their careers um, and some stability. It is, you know, with it being such a transient industry, you know, we're all growing up, people are settling down wanting to have children. And I think career growth as well as being able to have a commitment for a long period of time really matters. I think for Animal, one of our biggest things is our culture, you know, wanting to have, you know, a family environment. We are independently owned, so you know it's a little bit, I think, easier for us. Um, but it, you know, it's that work-life balance, having people feel like they're all valued members of the animal family, and you know that's the, one of our biggest pushes when we're speaking to people is our culture. And um, similar to the rest of the panel, we do a lot of cross-training between 2D, 3D, VR, motion comics. I think uh, we try and um, I spend. Every day, I have at least one-on-one -on -one with a staff member per day. You know, where do you want to be? Where are you going from? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Um, those type of things, that's uh, the best part of my day. Um, and then just trying to create that career path, bringing great television projects that people want to work on. Right. So speaking of developing people, what about uh, the developing the industry as a whole? Because this, I think, is, is the opportunity that lies in front of us. And, in many ways, it's already here. Vancouver, I think, is widely regarded as a hub, but it could be even bigger and or more sustainable or have more players in it, things like that. What do you see as strategies for your firm and then for the industry of making this the global hub for the animation, visual effects, and onto visual effect, or, um, VR and so on? Yeah, I think for us specifically, we I don't think we have a requirement to make Vancouver the base. Uh, I think we just want to have the strongest global presence, and I think we strategically choose places to be. And Vancouver is a great strategic choice for ILM to be. Um, in the future, how to keep, you know, I think the panel's touched on some of these points, how to keep Vancouver growing. I, I feel like we're at a great stage now, and taking a lot of those issues and kind of taking it to the next level, that's really where it needs to be for sustainability. I think there's a, a roadmap that London has paved for a lot of those issues. Uh, I think London, uh, when they went through their growth period, had did a great job in terms of uh, the facility sharing projects. So uh, the big players, Double Negative, uh, Framestore, and MPC, constantly share projects. You almost can't get them doing one project in isolation. They're always sharing work. And I think that's really the future. And I think, um, I mean, generally speaking, I've never had a negative experience sharing with another studio. It's not like, uh, it's never a fist fight. And honestly, I find most of the artists have worked together at other studios together. So they're in the trenches together. Um, it's always quite positive. Um, and I think so, that's an area. So this would be a key strategy for growth would be more sharing and the model being London, mm -hmm. are we just putting a toe in on the sharing? Are we doing a fair bit of it? I mean, a lot of it's happening already. I mean, I think Sony probably does more sharing just because we tend to break off larger pieces, but. I yeah, I think, it's, uh, I think it's definitely happening more. It's kind of become what happens in the industry, but I do remember when we were trying to build Vancouver as a hub. And um, that, that was a really key part of messaging and how we were gonna get there when I can think back to 2009 when uh, MPC had arrived and just uh, finished on Watchmen, which was our first big project. And that was for Warner Brothers and all the other major studios were really interested in working here, but everyone was nervous to do it. Did we have enough talent to do it? And we, so we had to come up with strategies. We knew to become a hub, we needed to hit critical mass of companies and so that 
the studios would be willing to um, award large projects, not just to one company, but multiple companies. And I remember clearly talking to those companies at the time, saying, and it was less common then to share. We were sharing projects, but we weren't sharing assets. We weren't sharing sequences and being really vocal about, absolutely, I would, uh, we're very good at that. We love working with Imageworks. We love working with Digital Domain. We're very good at it. And at that time, it was a little bit unusual to do that. We wanted, everyone wanted to control their IP, control their assets. But we knew that we needed the, if not, uh, actual yet a perception of a hub so and the ability to So you talked about purpose. collaboration before it was actually a really big thing. And I think also when other companies came to town, we really embraced it because again, we knew those of us who are here already that we needed critical mass to hit yeah. that hub. And, and I think that's what set us off on collaboration. While we fight like dogs for <laughs> the projects and the talent, we come together on industry issues to try and solve them together. Right. And especially issues of talent. When you talk about critical mass, are we there? Is it just about there, or is... No, I think we're there. We're there, yeah. We're, yeah. We can always grow more, and we yeah. should keep growing more. But there is but kind of a thing that you've got to get Absolutely. to a certain spot. I think it's structured growth from now. Yes. You know, there's a global shortage of talent in visual effects and animation around the world. There's so many films that I think even the studios themselves are saying, how are we going to get all of these done? And they are looking to buy out studios for years in advance, so they know they've got the capacity. I think if we grow too fast, too quickly, we can sort of self-destruct a little bit. So mm -hmm. I think I think the studios need to partner together to make sure that they can maintain that sort of top tier delivery of work without sort of imploding each other. And exactly. <laughs> yeah. So sustainable growth. Yeah. yeah. And we say no to projects now all the time. We know that we really can't get beyond 250, 300 in this market, but it will settle. You know, because ultimately having the critical mass being reached is beneficial. It's so beneficial for us all. It's just as we are today, um, you know, we, we don't even bid on things because we know when we, they show us a schedule that right. we, because a lot of times we can't go overseas because so much of our television industry is built on the tax credits. So we need BC labor right. um, and, and there's only so much. Do you see another player moving into town? Is that going to be one of the ways it grows, or is it going to be individual studios growing? I don't know who else there is to come. Yeah. Yeah, there's some, there's some. I don't know exactly what a, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I might just say, like, I feel like there's not necessarily a magic number. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what you would need to do is you need to build, you have a goal of what you want to achieve at the studio, and you build the team to do that. And so, for example, in the early days, uh, maybe to the kind of toe in the water comments, some of the studios had a small presence to see if it was going to work out, and they wouldn't necessarily execute an entire film here. They would execute part of it, have part of a team. Maybe they only do animation, or maybe they only do lighting, and so on. Now, you know, everyone's retained the physical space, retained the crews, and are executing on their plans. And I think for in terms of growth, it really comes down to what are the ambitions of each individual studio, and what do they want to achieve in Vancouver. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, for us at least, you know, we're, we're executing uh, on what we want to do. We have gone through a growth cycle recently where we, we have grown and now we're hubbing shows in Vancouver. And hub means that the entire thing kind of happens here, uh, whereas previously we were partnering with uh, the other locations. So that's a big step for us uh, in Vancouver, and we're proud to be a part of that now. Um, but again, that will probably will grow now, but there'll be a finite size. Right. Right. Actually, that, that brings up uh, one of the things that we talked about earlier about is growing above the line, about having a presence in the named parts of the movie, to, being, to having the, the part, people involved in the development and so on. And I, I maybe each of you could speak about the ways in which you're doing that and, and how it's advantageous and maybe the risks that go with that. Sure. Why don't we start? Down the, I yeah. Feel like we're, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're closest. Other way that. around. Uh, okay. I know. Uh, yeah, that's a, that is something that's important to us um, so that we stop being just a service center in television and that we're seen as creative and can develop. Um, we're currently developing a very high-end CG television show and I would say that we even took less budget to get those credits for our people because it's so important that we're seen as um, uh, not just service but that is, um, you know, we don't get just a package handed to us from Los Angeles and no execute, which the team's doing very well but we need to keep growing beyond that. And so those credits are worth everything to us to get above the line. And it sounds like they're good for the company, but they're also good for the individuals. They are, their careers absolutely. And their... Exactly, and that's, some, that's a way that, again, tying it all together, we can retain those individuals because they do get big directing credits, um, right. 
which is, you know, um, important to the. But sometimes those people are different than your regular animator, right? They're story people. They're development. They come out people. of every any department. Um, storyboards a lot, um, but they. We've I've worked with directors that have come out of almost every department. You never know. Right. <laughs> and they become a calling card for your studio as well. Absolutely. So absolutely, and it allows us to do higher end work, better projects, which keeps talent. All of it's intertwined. So people then start to come. With the work comes to to that person. E exactly. Right. Is that? Yeah, I think you know those, you know, title cards and things like that. They you know they are a political issue. I think with the studio credits always are in our industry. How many people get dropped off the list? Um, but I think it does come down to setting a precedence as well, um, putting your top creative talent at the forefront of what the projects that you're doing, making sure that everybody sees the value that they're bringing. And once you set a precedent with that person, you know, different studios will be able to see that that is what they're worth and you can carry that through for future films. Um, as a, we started in the service industry as well and that was one of the biggest challenges is getting our people and our name up to the top. And it really comes with, you have to fight for it um, and once you get there, you've sort of set that benchmark of what it takes to work with your studio. I think that's a key point, putting that top talent out front and center in your, in your business development even and, and making them a calling card. Having been here long enough, I can, I, I'm still really proud of the opportunities that we've had to grow talent here. I can think of people who started with us um, when I had Technicolor visual effects working on these very small movies and who joined MPC at very junior level and who are now uh, title card visual effects supervisors on some of the world's biggest movies and it should it makes me really proud and it makes me really proud for what we've achieved here that's amazing absolutely and i think we're fortunate because of ilm's longer history that we have a lot of the groundbreaking people who were involved from the start. So uh, we kind of have some of the, the rock stars, the Dennis Murins, the John Knowles of the industry, and I think you know people just love their contact with them, any contact they can. Um, so that's great, and they have such prominent roles in the company to drive the creative and um, you know be a symbol for ILM. Uh, so to Michelle's point, I think that's that's great to have. Right. So in, in fact, those above the line people. They're an attractor for all the other people who just want to work with them. Exactly. So it's good yeah. for the company, it's good yeah. for those people, and it's also good for the other people who are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're getting the, uh, the cut. I can't believe the time went by so fast. <laughs> I, but I, want, I wanted to, if we could just uh, end with maybe a. I think that the, the, you know, the elephant on the table or the Canadian equivalent, the moose in the tent is, you know, are we going, have you ever heard that expression? <laughs> no, I've never heard that. That's awesome. <laughs> and, and I'm I heard that in Ontario. <laughs> um, but, you know, are we going for big, the big times here? Is this going to be the biggest and best place for visual effects? Maybe with, you know, sub offices in San Francisco, but, but can we make that statement here? Is this, have we arrived? I, I think Vancouver's absolutely arrived. Uh, I think the one that I might say, it's not necessarily a contest per se. I, I think Vancouver is in a global marketplace. Cities are gonna rise up and become hubs. And Vancouver is one of those hubs. And I'm proud to be a part of that and um, proud of all the people who built that up over the years. And so, you know, in my introductory remarks, I mentioned that, you know, I started in Canada and those opportunities didn't exist here. And it's fantastic to come back and they now do. Um, so. I think it's great and it's, it is a hub. It is a hub and it's, and it's doing some of the world's best work for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think there was no option to do otherwise. We, visual effects, especially kind of grew out of the film industry here and the film industry pretty much from day one when it took off was competing with the best in the world and it had to be offering the best service and certainly when we went into visual effects here, it was immediately to be the best, we were, there was no we take a little time and get used to this. It's we want to work on the biggest movies. We might have started small with our parent companies, but we knew we had to do the best work, and we are. Right. So it's not just big, it's best. It's best. Yeah. It's More than big, it's best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and in such a diverse ecosystem. So that's, you know, a unique thing that we have here in Vancouver. And everybody's doing amazing work. Yeah, and it, it pushes you to be better. I mean, if we were <clears throat> a smaller television industry without the bigger players here, we wouldn't be pushing as hard as we are. Right. And we do because we want to be better. So I think just that general attitude will keep propelling us forward. And it is it is the hub. I mean, people know it as the place to go, clients especially. 
Well, congratulations. I'm very proud to be a resident of this hub, and it provides great opportunities for our young people, and, so I, and it's a great economic engine for our community. So thank you very much.